My guests today are Lizzie Garvin and Laura Stieghurst. Lizzie is the Foundation and Fellowship Director at the New 776 Foundation, the philanthropic arm of the venture capital firm with the same name, both founded by Alexis Ohanian. Lizzie helped run Reddit, was chief of staff at Initialized Capital, working alongside Alexis, and holds the same role as co-founder at 776, the firm. Laura Stieghurst is one of the first 776 fellows. She is the co-founder and CEO at Basico, where they are working to understand how we can safely rebalance ocean chemistry using natural mechanisms to remove CO2 from the ocean and restore coral reefs. No biggie, right? Combined, these two humans are a shining example. Humanity's young people are most affected, are most ambitious, doing hard things because we have to, because they want to, because in the end, they're the best ones to do it. And some of these things they're working on, like GPS was, antibiotics were, like refrigeration was, or solar power, mRNA vaccines, these things might be possible. They might change the world. Many of them, most of them will fail, but we don't know until we try. And what Lizzie and Laura are trying is incredible. I'm so excited to have you both here and to talk about all of the adventures uh, you guys have going. That is a very exciting chandelier you got going on back there, Lizzie. It's a photograph, Vienna. That's a fo- Damn it, fooled again. <laughs> well, that stumped me the first time I saw it. I was like, what weird illusion? I know, that's impressive. And I just look like I've been keeping people kidnapped here. So listen, let's get serious, enough. Lissy and Laura, I'd like to start with one important question. Instead of what is your entire life story? I'm sure that's wonderful and great. I like to ask, why are you vital to the survival of the species? And I encourage you to be bold and honest because you're here for a reason. Many guests cackle the first time they hear that or tell me I'm not. And then you, we usually actually get something illuminating and thought provoking. So why are you vital to the survival of the species? Yeah, wow. That is quite the question. <laughs> I mean, if we were to jump straight into it, I guess with my most recent new position at the foundation, we'll just talk about the fellowship program because I get to fund people like Laura with grants who are actually solving solutions for the world population. Yeah, I guess that makes me kind of vital because I'm helping these young people tackle huge issues, especially related to climate right now. That's great. You're done. Congratulations. She got the easy answer. I, on the other hand, get to be the young person that takes all the money and puts it to good use. So we could call it, I'm, I'm vital to humanity's uh, wealth redistribution. Let's say that. Do it. Sure. Beside the awesome fellowship from 776 Foundation, I am happy to redistribute Elon Musk's wealth as well as part of the XPRIZE competition. That'll be my contribution to humanity i will happily redistribute i mean a lot of people well. cheering for you yeah <laughs> totally i feel like laura you said it really well the other day you were what you said that you watched one of the launches and you were like i wish elon would do more for like earth than he was for up in space mm-hmm. i butchered yeah. your quote but <laughs> that's a that's a great story actually of how i came to be involved in all of this, if we want to get started with that. About a year ago in, in April, there was a, X-Pri- or a SpaceX rocket launch in Cape Canaveral. And so I decided to do a trip up to, up to the Cape and watch the rocket go off. And it was really, really impressive. And in the early morning hours, I was watching it go off in amazement and thinking to myself, you know, like, wow, this is so cool. But I wish that Elon Musk would spend as much money helping to save the earth as he was enabling people to leave it. And that very same day was the announcement of the XPRIZE carbon removal competition that he was funding. And so I get back to class the next Monday, and that's the first thing one of my professors presents to us in class. And I knew that I had to get involved. I had at that point, no background in carbon capture. I was like, this is my calling, clearly. So got to figure it out now. I have 76 questions. One, what was this class you walked into? Clearly it wasn't, you know, like Western democracy or, or something like that. I mean, it, it must be somewhat technical, correct? Yes, it was uh, climatology and extreme weather events. So okay. my so professors... within the realm, the realm of reason. Yes, yes. That's offered um, in Florida. And also offered to environmental science majors. 
Okay. All right. So we're checking a few of them. I'm, I'm like the liberal arts nerd. Like I'm like a pagan atheist monster who was a religious studies major. And now I nerd out on this stuff all day. So at least you're within within striking distance. All right. That's that's pretty compelling. One of my favorite things to do was I, I had a co-host for a long time with the, with the show when we have like really technical conversations. So if the goal of this was just like, hey, Laura, we're going to nerd out on exactly what you're doing and ocean acidification and all that stuff. Or we talk to these incredible, these two women women scientists who are working with the Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, which does pediatric cancer research. And they're scientists and they're working with zebra fish to cure cancer. And I would stop and I would turn to my co-host Brian on the show and I'd say, all right, Brian, where would you start? Like, what is step one for this? Because how do you even, where, where do you buy zebra fish? I don't know, much less how to use them to like cure cancer. So I'm glad that you were at least like, oh, this is something I'm, I would know where to start. That's helpful. This is great because I mentioned to you guys offline, where we like to provide the most value is sort of answering the question for folks, what can I do? And usually my first answer is, well, what can you do, Lissy, Laura? Because it's usually this nexus of what, what, what am I into, whether it's something now or seventh grade science you liked? What are your transferable skills? And then I can give you these 7,000 different problems and opportunities across climate or public health or whatever where those things apply, right? But they love hearing from folks like yourself about sort of why you got into it. So can we take a step a little further back and say, why were you taking a climatology class besides living in Florida and and the seas going up like that? So, yeah, I mean, I have always been interested in environmental science and, and, you know, even from a little kid, like I couldn't really imagine doing anything else. I would say my background would be in citizen science uh, because that's really where I fell in love with this kind of work. Since middle school, my mom started pushing me to kind of look for opportunities um, at the intersection of science and current events. And in Florida, that happened to be a lot of, you know, marine ecological disasters. So uh, from invasive lionfish to uh, harmful algal blooms to coral bleaching, that's always where I sort of caught interest in any sort of school project where I had an option to pick my own topic. That's where I was directing my focus. And I found a lot of encouragement from scientists who needed people with passion and free labor and interest in their work. And you'd be surprised how many like really impressive scientists would let like a middle school kid get into their experiments. And it was an amazing community that I found in Miami, especially of marine scientists, because it's so niche and they're so passionate. And it really encouraged me to just send those cold emails and look for help and get involved in things that I didn't really have a background in. And so when I, I got to college and I was like, well, what can I do to help? And I figured I'll study environmental science. That's pretty rad. I grew up here on sort of coastal Virginia. We have this thing called the Virginia Institute of Military, uh, Military Marine Science. Uh, VIMS. And I remember thinking it's really cool, but never really understanding that that's like a job, that that's a thing that people can go do. Also, nowhere, like nobody was worse at flashcards than me. So this, it was not happening as a job once that became evident. It is so fascinating to hear people talk about, again, you know, like you said, your mom saying, get into the intersection of environmentalism and current events. And it's like, welcome to 2022. Like that, that's what we're doing. So that's awesome. That's really cool. Uh, Lissy, you have been Quick scan of your LinkedIn, a founder, an event planner, worked in advertising, PR, you helped run Reddit, co-found 776. You, you, you're you literally making our podcast recording software work right now. Uh, how did we get to the 776 uh, f- foundation? How, how mm. what, is, what was the conversation? Was it you? Was it Alexis? How did you find your way into philanthropic stuff now after everything else? Well, so I started out working for Alexis, which is crazy to even say almost seven years ago. I think this fall, it'll be seven years And at the time I was living in San Francisco and I, everyone was working in tech and I was like, I just got to go try this tech thing out because I'm not going to live here for forever. So one of the first jobs I got was this role at Reddit. And at the time 
I think there were like 45 of us. I remember walking into the office and I had this like imagination of what a tech company looked like. And it was the opposite. It's like popcorn ceilings, really bad lighting. Oh, and no. I remember, <laughs> yeah. But That's I, not what the pictures say. No, it's fully not. It's 100% not what the shows show or anything. But I remember sitting with Alexis and Steve and Marty, who was the CTO at the time. And I was listening to them talk about like what the plans were for the future. And I was like, huh, there is going to be so much room to grow at this place. Like, I don't even know what Reddit is, but I'm going to figure it out. And the, genuinely, I the day before, I remember I signed up for Reddit. I had a username. It was my first and last name. The week I started, they were like... Yeah, not really the point. Got to change that. Can't have it be your first <laughs> right. and last name. You literally misunderstood the entire <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, but after I worked there for a couple of years, and then um, as Alexis's chief of staff there, we went full time at Initialized, his first venture fund, and that's where I like really fell in love working with founders from like the very beginning ideas. A lot of times they wouldn't even have like a pitch deck and be like, Alexis, I have this vision. And Alexis would be enamored and like, yes, I 100% see what you're saying. We need that. Um, And ultimately, when the pandemic happened and everyone was forced to stay inside, I think it caused a lot of us to think about the future and what kind of impact we want to have, what work looks like. And Alexis started 776 The Fund and I and myself, myself and Caitlin Holloway uh, left Initialize to join him. And we'll call it mm, the last five years. Alexis is really good about like, what do you want your future to look like? What kind of work is most meaningful to you? What do you get joy out of? And we always circled back to wanting to do something good and having some sort of impact. And so when he talked about the foundation and being ready to launch that, I got really excited and I was like, what, what's the focus going to be? Like, what are you thinking? And uh, ultimately he was like, why don't you run it? Like, why don't you, like, I trust you so much. You've been in this chief of staff role for six years. Like, how about you take a shot at running this thing? And he was like, it's going to be about fighting inequity worldwide. And so we ultimately decided fighting climate change. Small problems. Small problems. Manageable. But, you know, the thing about having someone like Alexis as your boss is that two things. He has the money to make a difference. He has the capital, but he also has the platform. And I think that having both of those things is really powerful, especially when you use it for good. I mean, all the time Alexis is calling on people and like giving call to action. I think that was really exciting. Also why the inequity worldwide problem is what we ultimately decided to have the foundation be about. And then starting with climate change. I mean, that is so crucial right now to the world and it affects everyone on a daily basis and it disproportionately affects marginalized communities. So I think there's kind of a no-brainer to begin there. As my wife says, I have the unique ability to be the bummer in any conversation now because we could be talking about Cheetos or whatever. And I'm like, let me tell you about how it connects to climate change. She's like, can I have five minutes without I'm like it's everywhere totally but I think the the important thing and what I have felt from working with the 20 fellows I mean you all are Laura you guys are what 18 to 23 years old like so young and like listening to all of you talk about your projects, ideas, companies, there is not any doom and gloom behind it. Like it's so energetic and exciting. And it's like, yes, we are going to solve these problems. Like there's actually no other way other than to solve them. I'm trying to take the doom and gloom out of my conversations as well because I I go the same way, Quinn. No, it's it's easy to. I had a really interesting conversation with a woman, uh, Dr. Britt Ray, recently about climate psychology and just about like, you know, we do need to sit with these things and we need to process them because they can be very hard. And obviously I'm incredibly privileged and, and I'm not seeing the 
enormous daily effects that so many folks, so many marginalized folks are. But part of the reason we left Los Angeles is literally my home was uninsurable anymore because they were like, yeah, sorry, it's totally going to burn down in the next five years. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not even a question. At least I was privileged enough to get to that point where we could have it up to that. Right. A lot of people were already, it's out of here. But at the same time, right, that's part of the reason we focus on the action step stuff here is, and part of the reason I like to have these conversations is, Again, feeding off the energy of people like Laura and like yourself, Lissy, again, who are enabling these things um, is is incredible. You know, I talked to some guy a couple of years ago. He's like, I think I figured out how to pull water out of thin air. I'm like, what? That's how? fucking nuts. Like, let's do this thing. You know, that's mm-hmm. crazy. And also, we need it everywhere. Let's do it. It's, you know, you can't have enormous, complex, systemic problems that touch everything without profound opportunities to rewrite the way we do everything and the way totally. we consume things and make things and redistribute things. So let's talk potatoes about these fellowships. So correct me everywhere I'm wrong, which is how most of my days go. I have three children. I don't get away with anything. 20 climate fellows, ages 18 to 23, which is wild. 100K each received over the course of two years. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And the goal is 10 years, 20 million out the door. Is that right? 100%. Yep. Got to be full time, right? So Mm -hmm. if you're in school, you got to drop out. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Fascinating. Wide range of applications, technological, social, political, sociological, whatever, could even be 501c3 adjacent. Is that correct? Yeah. We have, um, so in this first batch, we have three youth activists that are building their 501c3s, two that are doing research, and then everyone else is starting a startup. Laura's fixing the ocean, so we know that. Check. Yes. Done. (laughs) Great. I love on the website it says, this is not about networking. You you have full access to 776 and Cerebro, but your job is to ship, right? Mm-hmm. What I loved about this is it reminds me of one of my favorite groups, uh, one of my favorite humans, uh, Amanda Littman, who runs Run for Something, which uh, organization they explicitly work with progressive state and local candidates under 40 because they're like, the receipts are in on everybody else. It's look around. It's not great. So all these incredible people, like you said, Lizzie and, and Laura, just hearing you, it, it, the the energy and the excitement and, and also you're being affected by these things every day. So you're in the best position to affect them. Um, Laura, what made you, besides watch the rocket go up, I wish Elon would do more besides the pretty cars and the space things. What made you be attracted to this new fellowship? What made you feel like I have a shot at this and these are the kind of people I want to work with? The fellowship, you know, I received this, the the link to the application through a student who attended one of my information sessions. And as soon as I went on the website, I was like, this is it. Uh, because as an innovator um, who's working in climate, it's hard to find funding where you don't end up being owned. And I saw the tone and the culture of this fellowship, you know, it wasn't interested in networking. It wasn't interested in our resumes. It was purely about getting the work done, finding the solutions. And, you know, I didn't know this at the time, but after speaking to Alexis, I totally got that off of him. Just that, you know, whatever the obstacles are, we can figure it out, but we need to get this work done. Um, and that's really what I've been interested in. Um, I, know I didn't take a traditional route out of school. Um, I graduated in December and November was the announcement of the X Prize Award. And up to that point, I had not applied to a single job. So I was, I was, I had all my eggs in one basket to my mother's dismay. Um, and, but it was what I wanted to do. And I was so passionate about the solution. Once I saw this application, I knew that this was my opportunity to really expand on the work that I was doing and to partner with a foundation that had that platform and that capital to grow my business and make it, you know, the scale that it needs to be to really effectively capture carbon. And I imagine got your mom off your back a little bit. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, fellowship and XPRIZE, it's like, can I, can I have a minute now? To, <laughs> to, to, I'm doing something, right? Yeah. It's really funny, you know, how much the tone around environmental science has changed. When I first declared that as my major, my dad, especially, who's like, what employable skills will you have? Like, what is ecology? Why are you taking that? And then now, you know, a year after graduation, they're like, we're so proud of you. Like, we don't know what you're doing, but we're really proud of you. I mean, again, I was a religious studies major. Everybody, I remember 
like last week of college, standing with a buddy who majored in the classics. So, you know, Greek and things like that. And we're watching on a TV, which, Laura, I'm not sure if you're familiar with their boxes that go on the ceiling. And it was a broadcast that only aired at the same time for everybody. And it was like CNN or something. It was like top 10 most lucrative college majors, religious studies and classics, not on that list. And we were just like, we've made an enormous mistake. And my parents were like, you've made an enormous mistake. And so I totally get the limited options things, but it seems like on the other hand, now your skill set and your, you know, professional aptitude is applicable everywhere. At the same time, you've decided you're going to remove all the CO2 from the ocean, which is just great for everybody. So why there? Why the oceans? Why this particular solve for this particular problem? Let's get nerdy on it for a minute. I love getting nerdy. Let's go. The first, the first answer, why the oceans, is because uh, the oceans hold about four times as much carbon dioxide per unit of water as the atmosphere. The, the oceans per year absorb 40% of our emitted carbon and overall hold 70% of the world's carbon. So it's a massive carbon sink, and it has the potential to hold so much more. The analogy that we like to use, uh, you know, the IPCC has set out this goal that we need to capture 10 million tons of carbon per year by 2050. And if the world's carbon reservoirs are a bathtub, we would be adding a drop to the ocean's bathtub, whereas we would be filling and overflowing the atmosphere's bathtub. So the proportion that we need to add to the oceans is so much smaller and it has so much capacity to hold carbon. The problem is uh, that once you sink carbon into the ocean, some chemistry happens and it becomes an acid. So if you've heard about ocean acidification, the problem with corals bleaching, that's all because carbon dioxide is being absorbed into the ocean. So the ocean has a bad case of stomach acid. And when you have stomach acid, you take an antacid. I get it. You're talking my language. Let's do this. So essentially what uh, the solution, the, the umbrella term is ocean alkalinity enhancement. And what alkalinity is, antacid, that both neutralizes the carbon, the carbonic acid that's already in the ocean, and it buffers against drops in pH pH scale, as we learned in elementary school, high on the scale is basic, low on the scale is acidic, in the middle you have neutral. What alkalinity is, is how tolerant the the water is to changes on that scale. So the more alkalinity that you add, the harder it is to become more acidic again. So what we're doing is increasing the ocean's ability to take in acid without having that negative ecological effect. So we're not actually necessarily removing carbon from the ocean. We're actually Mm -hmm. enhancing its ability to take on carbon without negative effects. A couple things. Thank you for talking to me like I'm a kindergartner. It's, It's the best way to get this thing going. So what is your, some would say the ocean is a big place, which pros and cons. What is your, let's start with your, I'm thinking about, so my brother's doing work in, uh, he's working with kelp farmers on a bunch of things. And I know there's the folks at Running Tide uh, who are doing a variety of different carbon sink stuff. And, you know, they're, they've got a long way to go, could totally fail like anything. Um, but, you know, they get interesting flack on both sides. Some people saying like, we've never really invaded the open ocean with near shore marine life. And other people are going like, the ocean's enormous. This is going to take like a profound amount of this stuff. Let's dial it down to, so what is your Zantac? Like, what is your mechanism for actually increasing uh, the alkalinity of the ocean? So I am working on the side of the solution that looks into the safety and efficacy of this technology. So I'm testing uh, alkalinity on corals to make sure that they're safe in the environment. Uh, and to demonstrate the benefits um, to marine life, and also testing the efficacy, you know, how much carbon can we actually capture through this solution. Now, the solution and the technology itself is being developed by a company called Planetary Tech. We're partnered with Planetary. I work for them part-time, 
the other half of my time in my research is funded by grants and by this foundation fellowship. The technology that Planetary is developing, their business has sort of three components. The production and you know sourcing of alkalinity, the distribution of it, and then the measurement to make sure that we are capturing that carbon. Mm-hmm. All three of those things then produces a carbon credit, and that is the actual product that we're selling and how we make money through this business. The sourcing of alkalinity, that is novel technology that they have patented. And then the distribution aspect and the measurement is really what I'm focused on. What we're actually creating, alkalinity um, comes out of our process in a liquid form. It's a mixture of water and these alkaline minerals because alkalinity comes from rocks, actually. Rocks that make up 90% of the Earth's surface. So we acquire those rocks from mine waste. Mines have to remove a whole layer of rock just to get at their metal ores. And that rock ends up in piles, um, leaching toxic waste. It can cause a lot of damage to the local communities. And so what we do is we process that rock. Uh, We actually remove up to 80% of any toxins or waste in that rock. By processing it, we purify it and we turn that into alkalinity, this water mixed with minerals, that then gets distributed into the ocean. So all that we're putting out there is water and purified rock minerals that are dissolved into that water. And we do this initially, we're looking at uh, wastewater outfalls. So uh, our wastewater that gets processed and treated, a lot of it ends up out in the ocean, several miles offshore. Mm -hmm. So those those pipelines, that infrastructure, is what we're targeting as a method of distribution because it already exists. And most of these wastewater plants use alkalinity to treat um, the carbon that's in their water. Um, We create organic carbon through our human waste and that gets treated through alkalinity. So essentially what we're saying is, hey, just add a little bit more alkalinity to capture more than just the carbon we're producing, a little bit of carbon that's in the atmosphere. And once it's it's out into the ocean, there's no additional energy that goes into the actual capture or storage of the carbon. Because this is part of a natural process, once that alkalinity reacts with the acid, it's stored in the ocean for hundreds of thousands of years. It sounds incredible. Um, again, it does inevitably seem like one of these conversations where I go, where would I start? I would get the rocks out of my kids' shoes, which inevitably end up like in my laundry machines, destroying the whole thing. Different conversation. But then do I smash them? Like h- how does one how does one process rocks? So the rocks are already ground up. Um, this is why we're seeking mine tailings that are you know already out of the ground because Again, that reduces the amount of carbon that we have to emit to process those rocks. Um, And then we put them through an electrochemical process. This is where, if you really want to nerd out, this is where we nerd out. Clearly, I can handle it. Bring it. At a high level, we, we put it into an acid leaching process. So this is a process that is commonly used to purify rocks. And that acid removes impurities and it also dissolves the rock to neutralize that acid. By neutralizing the acid, you end up with basic, a mixture of water that is basic on the pH scale, but that contains this property of alkalinity that will buffer against acids. To get really deep and technical into it, I'd have to bring on, you know, the electrochemist from our team, the metallurgists, you know, it's a, there's a whole team that works on this. But my my expertise is definitely, once we get that into the ocean, what happens on the downstream side? Perfect. So you're incredible. Thank you for sharing that and putting up with me. I mean, it's like talking to a toddler, I imagine. I wanted to both focus on that last part and your expertise, which is clearly so much more wide ranging than you're giving it credit for, but also back up to where you mentioned the credits. Because not unlike ESG investing, which, you know, you've been paying attention, has been a bit of a roller coaster because there's not really any standardization. There's not really any verification of what these things are across any of these markets. 
But at the same time, there's been this rush to build these markets for carbon offsets. So companies and industries and countries can issue vague net zero plans, right? While buying offsets and they can not have to worry about continuing to emit until someone finally regulates them. I love that you are actually working on the safety of this and the verification of this because we've seen so many issues with nature conservancy and like, would this forest already be protected if we weren't already paying for it? Or, you know, a a thousand different ways this just hasn't been corralled yet. How do you keep expectations in check? And Lissy, I imagine this is partly, you know, if you're looking at this from the fund side as well as, as these things as a business, how do you keep expectations in check from capitalism in general, from a whole lot of folks trying to do the right thing and accelerate removal and a bunch of folks desperately trying not to have to reduce their emissions and come to Laura and go, are your offsets ready yet? And Laura going, I'm not sure yet. I don't know what this is going to do to reefs yet. And we have to do this right before we just throw a bunch of cash at it. How does that side of the machine work? Oh, how can I answer that question? Because, you know, it's something that I think about a lot. Just recently, I, I visited Canada to meet with this company and they're based in Canada and we had a whole week of meetings, and really the bulk of what we talked about is how do we do this right? We're planning our first trial run of actually releasing alkalinity into the ocean in the UK. Um, It's going to be a 24-hour trial, and there's so many details of making sure that we don't leach any toxins, you know, a million different factors that go into it. And we do it because we want to have a really high quality product and we want to ensure that the carbon that we are capturing will actually be stored for hundreds of thousands of years like it's supposed to and measuring to make sure that that does happen. And the difficult part is that, like you said, the customer for this product doesn't necessarily care if the product is of high quality. What they want to buy is the right to emit or the sort of moral good standing to the public that we are a green company, that we are purchasing carbon credits. And the, the good that that does is distributed globally. You know, that company won't re- reap the direct benefits of it. And I think about this a lot, you know, with other sort of regulations like the FDA, If you buy a medicine that is not regulated by the FDA, you will see the direct negative effects of it. But if our carbon doesn't get stored properly, nobody's really going to know. And my perspective is just like, how do we make sure that the companies that are doing the really hard work to make sure that they have a good product, how do we make sure that they end up on top and that they see the reward from that? And that's really what, what I'm interested in doing and where I see Basico moving forward in that um, space. And actually yesterday we had a speaker um, from the White House, Melanie Nakagawa, and I asked her the same question, you know, we're in the space where we're learning a lot, we're doing the science, we're learning about all of these things that need to be regulated, but I'm a private company, how do we partner then with the government who has the power to regulate Um, to make sure that they know all the things that we know Mm -hmm. so that we can, you know, regulate the space because there's going to be a a lot of awkward growth time where people are trying to greenwash, where, you know, we've seen a huge explosion in the number of carbon capture companies that are starting up. You know, from Planetary's perspective and Basico's perspective, we look at some of these ideas and we're like, we tried that and we scratched that off the list ages ago. We knew that was never going to work. How are these people claiming that they're going to capture billions of tons of carbon when we know that fundamentally this doesn't work? But because carbon capture is such an exclusive piece of science, you know, it's definitely not something you learn in the classroom. It's very hard to, to weed out what a good idea is from a bad idea unless you're an expert in the field. And so I'd like to gain that expertise and, and be part of the regulatory environment to make sure that what we're doing really is good for the planet. That's incredible. I appreciate, I mean, that's a profound uh, perspective for, for someone who's, who's, you know, so early in their, their journey of solving all of these problems for us. Um, but it's 
it's fascinating, right? Because you're essentially saying, like, I need you to regulate me and I need you to know everything I know and I need you to regulate me. And I think about some of the conversations I've had with folks. So we've talked to two folks who are working on uh, mosquitoes and malaria and, you know, uh, or all of the mosquitoes are in Southern California now that have brought, brought dengue and West Nile and all these things that came over, I think, on a boat in like 2013. And so there's a bunch of companies and scientists going, well, let's just basically program them with gene drives and we'll release 7 billion of them. And that'll start to eliminate a bunch of these problems. And there's a lot of scientists like uh, my friend Natalie Kofler, who's going, hold on just a minute. Like we need to triple check and then triple check again, a whole host of shit before we can even get to the question of, is it going to work? We got to make sure nine out of 10 things aren't going to go bad before that. And it seems like that's a lot of what you're checking, and again, correct me everywhere I'm wrong, but it seems like it's make sure it's not doing all this bad stuff first or other unknowns, unknowns that we don't know about before we can even get to the part of like, is this helping to store carbon for 500,000 years? And that seems to be so many of the issues we've had as we've rushed into these credits about forests or mangroves or whatever it might be is going like, uh, hold on, what, what in California, like half the forests that people are paying credits for are burning themselves, which is releasing more carbon. It's it's complicated. This is all to say, I'm so glad that you are in the particular position of going, I need to make sure this works and it's safe before we do any of these things. And how do I partner with the government to make sure like this is as transparent as it can be? On the other side of that coin is we need to do it quickly. You know, we have to do it safely. We have to make sure that we're dotting all our I's and checking all of our T's, but we also can't just experiment and experiment and experiment for decades. Um, and so I was part of a conversation with the Aspen Institute. Um, there was a climate summit in Miami in early April, and it was surrounding a code of conduct. Mm. Uh, how do we do this work both safely and quickly? Do we scale it and make it affordable? And one of the things that you know everybody in the room agreed on is this notion of do no harm is nearly impossible. Because every day that we don't do anything, harm is already being done in the ocean because of decades of climate change. And so we sort of, you know, landed on these three principles of do no known harm, monitor for any unknown harms, and act quickly when we discover that harm is being done. These are like parenting principles. This is I'm going to plaster these in my kid's basement. One of the things I try to tell my kids is, especially with their enormous privilege, is like we have to do hard things. And doing hard things means you're going to fail all of the time. I fail all day. And it's going to happen. And you have to get comfortable with that. And you have to learn from it. It's the Michael Jordan thing of like, I took 7,000 shots and missed most of them, right? You get into the Baseball Hall of Fame if you go one for three over your lifetime. And that means, like you said, you've looked at all these other carbon capture versions and been like, they don't fucking work, but it's very clear. Like we do need to do some things. We do need your work or versions of it to work. We need to find out through process of elimination. Like when you're trying to diagnose some disease, right? Long COVID, whatever it might be, we start have to, we have to start checking these boxes and finding out what works. But like you said, we can't experiment forever, right? We have to really start working towards like, okay, but what does this mean at scale? And what does it do for coral reefs? That's profound because you know, it's not often that we've got a ticking clock right? When we've got all these brand new technologies. But at the same time, again, you look at what we've done with these mRNA vaccines. There were people like Dr. Carolyn Kuroko, who was working on these for 20 years and enabled us to get over the hump to be able to do these things. But it turns out when it affects everyone on the planet, you can throw a ton of money at these things and we get a little closer than we thought we've ever gotten before. So Lissy, I'm curious what lessons you've learned looking at it, both as someone who's running a philanthropic endeavor for the first time, but also as chief of staff of seven different things before and involved in the fund, what lessons you've sort of learned of, oh, this could be ap applicable to our fund as well, or this is how we can increase or widen the top of the funnel next time in 2023. And I know applications obviously aren't open for that yet, but how do we start to look at the implications of something like Laura's working on and think, oh, I've learned a lot from this already? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think from the start when I was going through all of these applications, I, like Laura mentioned, I definitely didn't look at it like a resume builder or what have you been doing? I mean, because at the end of the day, some of the fellows are 18 years old, so their resume is high school. Doing these essay questions and like, okay, how has climate change affected you? Like, why do you even care about this to begin with? 
And then how are you thinking about combating it? I think starting with those first guidance and principles made things a little bit easier for me because then I could start to look at areas like, okay, we have Dismiss in Kenya and how he was affected. And I think the biggest thing that I want to focus on for this next batch is making sure that the international presence is even bigger than what we currently have. Right now with the fellowship, I think we have 10 countries represented, which is amazing, but I don't have anyone from South America in the batch. And Fascinating. Yeah, and it's like that I know South America is 100% affected, or Mexico. No one from Mexico is in the batch. Do you think you guys just don't have the the reach to have gotten on the radar? Do you think there's a lack of messaging support on that side to find you guys? Like, what is the disconnect there, you feel? Yeah, I think I think that that's something that I'm starting to figure out. You know, obviously, this was our first batch. And so we used as much of Alexis's social network reach that we could. And I think I personally reached out to like 50 to 75 different climate organizations that I heard the youth follow or read their newsletters or whatever. And they were so generous and blasted it everywhere. But I think I need to like find people in South America, for example, like in Argentina or Brazil and reach those networks um, more specifically. All of those things being said, like we have representation from all over the world. And I think whenever we bring the fellows together and they're all talking about how climate change has affected them, whether it's wildfires in California or Africa's drought, I think that it's, yeah, I mean, it's been incredible to listen and learn. But yeah, definitely, I think this next batch, it's bringing in more people from other areas. It's a little addicting, isn't it, to meet people like Laura? And to like suddenly have that in your life, it's very difficult to go back and go, I'll just go do regular shit and spreadsheets. It's also so humbling. (laughs) Like going through the applications, I mean, we had, I think over 600 people apply for this first one, which is insane. And just reading through all of these essays, I had, I enlisted the help from one of our OIRs at the fund and an analyst And we would, after we would go through and do our ranking, we did it all totally blind. And I would be like, I was not doing this at 19 years old. So it's definitely been one of the most rewarding and humbling experiences I've ever experienced. And yeah, I'm very grateful for it. And exactly, I will never go to spreadsheets or a desk job. Spreadsheets are great. (laughs) But it's, it again, it is, it is so profound talking to, I mean, again, people like yourself and Laura who get specific on these type of things and go, no, I know how to do this. And I'm going to take a shot at it. And you're just like, holy shit. Because my resume 19 was like, how many different ways can you spin lifeguard and like part-time waiter who's not great at it, like frequently forgets people's side orders? Like, how do you spin that into something like this? The answer is you don't. Uh, You know, it's not going to go great. (laughs) Even just like talking like um, Valkyrie, she is working on, she's doing fires, like figuring out how to combat fires like quicker. And she was saying that the technology has pretty much hasn't been improved since the 70s, 80s. Like no one has touched that. And I think what Laura was touching on earlier when we spoke with Melanie yesterday for our speaker series, Melanie was like, get a policy person in right away so that you can start to work with the government and like use those resources in that network. And I think that that's also definitely going to help with this future generation that are solving and tackling all these issues. I mean, the thing to phrasing and and the words we use and the language we use are obviously so important and we're becoming increasingly cognizant of how those can be used to lift people up and enable people and it can be weaponized against people. Um, and it's amazing how far that can go uh, and how much it can help people. It's amazing how much really taking a step back and realizing, I mean, sh- just all the stuff that we cover here besides the fact that most of it intersects. It's all choices we've made. And that means, yes, we're behind the eight ball on some things because a lot of those things have compounded over time, but we can make different choices. And what that usually means is having folks 
that have very different lived experiences from the folks who've got to make decisions so far be able to make those decisions and be able to be empowered by a hundred grand over two years or other grants or whatever it might be that are, Laura, like you pointed out, there's really no strings attached besides like, now you got to get to work, right? We're not going to take anything. We're not going to own your business. Like not to rip on the fun <laughs> itself, but it's, but you know, that really matters because it really just enables again, folks. And it, it, again, it reminded me of, of run for something who who are feeling this, who are affected by it, who have family history or don't or whatever it might be to go out there and go like, no one knows better than me how to fix this because I see it every day and I feel it every day and that matters. And at the same time, like, again, you have these enormous problems, but the, the opportunity to fix them is so glaring. I mean, I remember having a conversation last year. I don't know. Time has no meaning anymore. The woman who started um, a cosmetics company called Beauty Counter, Greg Renfrew, and she's awesome. And her whole point was half of her mission is building her business, and the other half is she was like, look, the cosmetics industry has not been regulated since 1938. And you go, holy shit. Like, what are we, like, not to be, like, crazy about it, like, what are we putting on our bodies? And then you realize supplements aren't regulated at all, really. It's like, what are we putting in our bodies? And it just goes, like, we can make so much better informed choices without going gangbusters on this stuff. But again, that's why I appreciate someone like Laura who's like, I want to focus on, does this work? Are we, are we doing no harm first? whether it's known knowns or, or unknowns, because we have to promote that sort of position more. It's like we should have a chief liberal arts smart company person at every Facebook to go like, I don't know, should we do this? Because clearly like that person doesn't exist and it's not going great. This is all to say, I, I appreciate both of your, your roles in this and how you feel like this is a thing, whether it's new to you, Lissy, or, or otherwise, where you just go like, oh, I have to do this. And that is so compelling for folks like me to, to meet you, but also for those of us who are just like, how do we support your mission? Because there's nothing, and again, let's see, working at a fund all, these, all this time, it's, there's nothing more appealing than someone who's like, I'm going to do this. And I know how to do it better than anyone else. And you go, well, here's a check. Go figure it exactly. out. Exactly. Like, that's incredible. That's incredible. So how can our listeners specifically get involved, support your mission, Laura, Lissy, you know, how can they apply this sort of things themselves? A couple of things, again, specifically, they can mash their fingers against if that's helpful or things to read, whatever it might be, give, give them the way. I think, well, first off, if you're 18 to 23 years old and you're listening to this and you have an amazing idea to combat climate change, please apply to the second cohort of the fellowship, which will open probably February, March. So that is one way you can help is by starting a company or idea, a nonprofit, whatever, that um, is solving an issue. And then I think the other way is to just talk about more what these fellows are working on and the ideas that they're trying to solve and telling your friends about it and like sharing all of this information. Also, my DMs are always open on Twitter, so if you want to learn more about the fellows, I am happy to share about all 20 of them. Awesome. I love it. Laura, what can what can the people do to support you? I, I like to say that there are three levels of support. Uh, we were also talking about this with Melanie yesterday. You know, the grass tops are people like Alexis, people like Elon, who are giving their money towards these causes, creating opportunities to empower young people. We, you know, the youth, we are most knowledgeable on this. Like This really is our expertise because we're the ones growing through it, experiencing it, knowing that it will be our future and our burden to carry. And so really putting faith in the youth and understanding that we may not be experienced in traditional senses we may not have that built resume but we know what we're talking about when it comes to climate change and empowering those voices is so important i would say the middle tier is we got to get involved like i said when i heard about this competition i had no background in carbon capture and i got online and i looked up research papers and i tore through probably like 50 different research articles over the summer and learned about it and it's totally possible, and it doesn't have to be something that's on your resume. It could be something that you learn about on the go. When I did finally 
approached Planetary about wanting to work on their solution and pursue it, they're like, where the heck did you come from? Like, we've been waiting for somebody to just drop in our lap and so much help is needed. There's no such thing as like not having enough experience in climate change. Nobody has enough experience. So just like go after it, whatever opportunities you do find, you just have to go out and, and grab them. And then personally, how you can help support Basico, we're always fundraising. The climate is not cheap to to fix. Uh, our GoFundMe is uh, Basico2. So the two is the CO2 in Basico. And, uh, you know, follow us on social media. Also, Basico2, that's B-A-S-I dot C-O-2. You know, just support the cause as... as Terrible as it sounds, I really think that any knowledge that you retain about environmental science or climate change is like a gateway towards action. A lot of environmentalists get really mad about the whole straw situation because you would use a a metal straw in a plastic cup and it's like, well, what's the point of that? But I think that any action that people take, you know, if you're, if you get to the point where you realize how ridiculous ridiculous it is to put a metal straw into a plastic cup at least you're thinking about it and you're realizing it and then the next time you reach for a plastic cup you think oh maybe I'll get a reusable cup or you know a metal cup as well and and that awareness in one area then spreads to all the other aspects of your life and having a little bit of awareness in your uh, you know carbon footprint even if you can't or you don't think you can do anything about it, just clocking yourself for a second, stopping to think about it, that's doing a lot. Vote. Yeah, like you said, those those candidates that are 40 under, like, they need your support because uh, there's been a lot of dismay around politics and the effect of a single vote and everything that's happening in the Supreme Court who are unelected representatives. Politics matters. Politics are so intertwined in all of this, and it can't just be the Elon Musks of the world and the Alexis Ohanians that give their money towards individuals. It has to be collective and political action as well. I love it. Well, this has been fantastic. I have a last uh, couple quick questions, and then we're going to get you all out of here back to fixing the ocean and such. So you can answer these quickly, briefly, however uh, you would like. We ask everyone. First time in your life where you solo or with your little team, whatever it might have been, realized you had the power of change or the power to do something meaningful. Running for class treasurer, beating up a bully, you name it. Could have been anything. First one that comes to mind, I remember my freshman year of college, I took a sociology class and it was about animals and how harmful eating them is for the environment. And I was like, okay, I can become vegetarian and that will be my small contribution to helping the earth. Right. And now look at where you are. It's incredible. For each of you, who is someone in your life that has positively impacted your work in the past six months? And you cannot say each other. Okay. I think that since I took on this new role, I have had the opportunity to meet with so many people that A, work in the nonprofit space and B, specifically work in the climate space. So as a collective, this is like a brand new world for me, and I am super appreciative and grateful for all of their time and the learnings. I'll allow it. That's pretty good. Laura, who's uh, one human positively impacted your work in the past six months? We also allow dogs. I would say my, my mentor at the University of Miami, his name is Chris Langdon, and he's you know the first person to really take a shot on me like he he attended my very first information session I'll never forget I tried to drop a joke for a little bit of comedic relief and he was the only person to laugh and I was like yes this is this is the guy I need on my team and I asked him to be my mentor and to lead this research and he agreed and he has been so wonderful in this journey and in you know, really taking on this research as his own. He's studied the problem of ocean acidification for decades. You know, I've been waiting all of these decades for a solution, and now I finally get to research a solution. And he's, you know, as passionate about it as I am, and and that's, you know, invaluable in, in my work. Last one, what's a book in all of your free time that you've read this year that has either opened your mind to a topic you hadn't considered before or changed your thinking 
in some way? So I read a book called The Wild Trees, and it's about scientists in the 70s who were trying to find the tallest tree in the world. And they went, you know, bushwhacking through these sequoia forests. And it was both the challenge of finding the tree and measuring it. And then, you know, the personal journey of all of these scientists as they did it. It's incredible how these trees grow. There are entire ecosystems that exist on one tree. And they're, all of the trees are interconnected. They know exactly how to grow to balance themselves out. There are species of other plants and animals that exist in the canopies of these trees that don't exist down on the ground. Incredible. Absolutely incredible book. I think the most important book I've read, uh, it's called Climate. I'm blanking on the author, but it basically like flips the way that you think about climate change and different um, aspects. I had three different people when I was starting the foundation and telling them about what we were doing, tell me to read it, actually. So climate. That's amazing. Uh, Laura, I think you would love, I did a conversation with a woman um, named uh, Dr. Bronda Montgomery, who I think at the time was at Michigan or Michigan State. She wrote this book called Lessons from Plants. It's a little, not drier, but it's less like personal journey and more just like, can you imagine persevering in a world where you're stuck in a pot and you got to find a way to like find the sunlight, but you're stuck in a pot. But also this is what we've learned about how trees take care of each other and talk to each other and warn each other of things and help each other with these things. And you're just like, that is, it's, it's incredible. Um, all of those things blow my mind. So I'll definitely get in there and I'll check out climate too. Yeah, I was just looking it up. It's Charles Eisenstein. Okay, awesome. Very helpful. Thank you for doing my homework for me. This has been fantastic. You guys have already shared all your social such, uh, such and your your specific URLs on the World Wide Web. So we're done there. And um, I think I've taken enough of your time. I'm very thankful for you both. This was lovely. I'm glad we got it done. And that's it. Um, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. The work you all are doing is awesome. Thank you for having us. For sure. Thank you. Thank you.